Okay, what I'm going to show you now are some sites in Peru and Bolivia that you've probably never heard of, starting with this one. This is in uh, a little village called Santiago de Oje, near Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. And it's called the Serpent Temple for obvious reasons, because it has this serpent-like uh, coiled figure carved into very hard sandstone. And it's a megalithic site that looks like it suffered some kind of catastrophic damage. Nobody knows what culture made it. It was not done by the Inca. It was not done by the Tiwanaku civilization. So it's a great mystery. And here you see the strange blackening of the surface. Um, it is possible that at one time it was lying down. And this is uh, simply the result of aging or it's also possible that it was struck by intense high heat in the very distant past. And here I am behind the serpent figure. And the curious thing is that it is looking towards the ancient location called Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, also located near Lake Titicaca, but about 40 miles away. So as you can see, the whole site is in a, a state of chaos. Uh, the local people, one would think, maybe smashed all these giant stones up in order to make building material, but almost all of it is still there. So I think an ancient cataclysmic event, possibly an earthquake, struck the site, and the, uh, the surfaces are very fine and very hard, and so I think this was constructed using ancient high technology of some kind. So this just gives you another view of the area, the fact that you have blackening of some of the surfaces of the stones, some are broken up, uh, others are buried underground, and it's a, actually a giant rectangle, it's quite large in scale, but almost nobody uh, visits this location, maybe 20 people per year, and if you want to look it up on a map, it's called Santiago de Oje. Then next, with uh, Lake Titicaca in the background, we have this interesting megalithic work, which they call the Orca del Inca, or the Hanging Place of the Inca. But in fact, it's a pre-Inca structure made as a giant solar calendar. It has the solstices and the equinoxes uh, shown as holes in the, the walls uh, in the surrounding area. And unfortunately, some of the cross pieces have been taken away or have fallen down. But this is another artifact <coughs> that very few people know about. Luckily, we were there quite close to, I think, the winter solstice. So as you can see, the sun is above. And the way it was designed was so that the sun would set right in between these two giant vertical stones. So an ancient solar calendar, again made by a culture unknown. It was not made by the Inca, but in general what happens is anything in this area is labeled as being Inca uh, as a convenience more than anything else, not as a proof of who did the work. And simply to show you a sense of scale, there I am in between the two giant horizontals. We don't see any actual tool marks, so it could be that this is so ancient that all the tool marks have worn off. Next, we're at another location near Lake Titicaca called Kenuani. And again, nobody knows who made this. <coughs> the uh, material is volcanic tuff, so it's a compressed volcanic ash. It's not extremely hard, but nobody knows what it was used for. You can see that there are curved staircases going up, uh, many of them. And then from a distance, this is where you see the different staircases going from basically the flat area up in curves, interconnecting, uh, interesting circular shapes. Uh, it does look to some degree like a stadium, but a stadium for who and a stadium by who. There are also indications that it continues into and under the lake, possibly only 10 or 20 feet deep, 
But it's one of those places, it took me uh, from seeing the first photographs about five years to find it. And even the local sergeant of the police, whose office was half a mile away, didn't know where it was. But we did track it down. So again, this uh, with the bus there, this shows you a sense of scale and people in the background. It does look like a ceremonial structure of some kind, but who made it, when, and why is at this point unknown. I've only been once, but it's obviously a location to visit over and over again in order to try to figure out uh, the mystery of Kenawani. So here, for a sense of scale, you have this curved area uh, that's more or less in the middle. And with the people standing there, that gives you a sense of the scale. We did find tool marks there, somewhat similar to what we find or found in places like Baalbek in Lebanon. It's like a series of, of chisels uh, together, cutting away at the surface like this. Again, it's not a hard material. But uh, it's one of those great mysteries that you learn about and then you have to, at some point, track down. So here, again, with a sense of scale, uh, these very interesting steps, very human-sized, not stairs, but could have been some kind of ceremonial seating. But there was no large area in the front to do any kind of performance. So it basically faces the lake and is one of the curiosities, one of many, that we've recently been tracking down in the highlands of Peru and Bolivia. So here again, nice flat surfaces, vertical and horizontal. The intersection point is curved slightly, so they're not sharp angles coming together like that. And uh, this is obviously a natural outcrop. And interestingly enough, the stone from uh, that makes up Puma Punku, which is another great mystery in Bolivia, comes from a mountain in the background here. So we are actually approximately 50 miles or 70 something kilometers away from Puma Punku and Tiwanaku. So here I am simply again, the sense of scale. You see the rough tool marks here on the surfaces, uh, age unknown. Culture that made it unknown, function unknown. And now we're an at another location near Lake Titicaca called Amaru Muru or Aramu Muru. And you see the man with the, uh, the straw hat more or less in the center. <coughs> Look beyond him and you'll see what is a portal. So you see, in terms of human scale, uh, it's believed to be an energetic portal. This is a red sandstone, so it's very high in quartz crystal content, very high in iron content. Both of those are energetic uh, materials. And then you see a, a, a slot on the left-hand side and a slot on the right-hand side. We had a number of dowsers with us there. And one of them was able to measure the energy using dowsing rods. And he believes that the central portal is of a more masculine energy and that the ones on the side are of a more feminine energy. But again, it's not something that the Inca made, not something that the Tiwanaku culture made. So it's another one of the mysteries at Lake Titicaca that is, as of yet, unexplained. And this simply gives you another view of uh, what it looks like. It's actually similar to what we see, <coughs> interestingly, in Petra in Jordan for some reason. I'm not saying there's a connection between the two. Too many people draw these um, comparisons and say, well, it looks like that, so it must have been the same culture. We have absolutely no idea. And there again, just with another sense of, uh, sense of scale. It's one of a kind. There's nothing else like it in the area of Lake Titicaca. So, so who made it? When? Why? Still unknown. But it's called Amaru Muru or Aramu Muru. Then this much smaller structure, uh, again close to Lake Titicaca. And it's made of basalt stones. 
Uh, it's called the Fertility Temple, and when you look at the two phallic-shaped stones, that it makes it kind of obvious why it's called that. Some people think that they're not uh, phalluses, but in fact mushrooms. Um, however, it uh, was used during Inca times as a fertility temple. You see it's megalithic in nature. All the stones uh, of the wall interlock. The actual location of the quarry for this material is presently unknown. So whether the quarry is nearby or far away, we, uh, we just don't know. And it's actually a series of two walls. The inner wall is much rougher than the outer wall, but it's another one of the curiosities that we find in the Lake Titicaca area. There are a lot of ancient structures at uh, Lake Titicaca that are not visited that much by um, tourists. And uh, so we look forward to continually going back to the Lake Titicaca area to discover more of these ancient structures. So this shows you the way into it. Again, almost like it's guarded by two phalluses. And this is the way in. Uh, very large megalithic blocks on the left and right. Again, a, the very hard stone called basalt. And then on the inside, numerous of these phallus shapes. Uh, some are facing upwards, some are facing downwards. Um, it's possible that the uh, Catholic Church in behind had uh, some influence on it in terms of uh, possible damaging uh, it because they kind of uh, cast a, a sour look on anything that would be regarded as a fertility temple. But again, the culture that made it is unknown at this time. Uh, just another one of the mysteries <coughs> that you discover in the Lake Titicaca area. So here again, some phalluses facing upwards, some facing downwards. Uh, again, some people think that it's a, a temple of mushrooms used for ceremonies involving mind-altering substances. But for me, I think it's a, quite simply a fertility temple of some kind. And then we are at Silustani, and uh, this is also quite close to Lake Titicaca. It's a, uh, this is a smaller lake. It's about the same altitude as Lake Titicaca, and this curious looking island in the middle with a flat surface. It's most likely a natural geological feature. Uh, some people, of course, speculate it's a place where flying saucers would land and take off. Personally, I haven't experienced that there, but um, one never knows. It's a very mysterious landscape. And so at Silistani we find all of these interesting looking towers. And the towers are called Chulpa. So here on the right side you see one of the major Chulpas and uh, it's narrower at the bottom than at the top and curves at the top. And the back hand, or the back side of it, is actually shows signs of catastrophic damage. So once again, archaeologists believe that the Inca constructed it, but it's highly unlikely because it's of a megalithic nature. The stones that are left interlock perfectly, and so this had to have been created using high technology of some kind. So what's uh, curious is when we look at the back side of it. So you see you have an outer, uh, outer area or outer layer, which is made of basalt stone with these pockets in it. And those pockets actually could have been used for resonance. You would think that there would be like a male aspect that would fit into the female hollow, but that's not the case. A female part would meet the female part. And so I think we're looking at a resonance structure of some kind. And then you have the core part, which is made of a different kind of stone called andesite, which is much more dense than basalt. And if you take two of those stones and strike them together, they create a ringing sound. So it seems to have been a vibratory structure made of two kinds of stone. The outer area seems maybe to have been an insulator, and there is access into it, and the inside of it is actually domed like a beehive. So it was used, or they were used, uh, as uh, tombs, 
during Inca and pre-Inca times, but the Inca did not construct it. And so again, it's one of those mysterious things that we find in the Lake Titicaca area. Next, we are at the Island of the Moon, which is in Lake Titicaca. And this is an Inca period construction. Uh, Island of the Moon being a place of spiritual energy for women, for the priestesses of the Inca time period. And it's a relatively rough construction, but this is typical of Inca work. <clears throat> Contrary to popular belief, the Inca did not make the megalithic structures in Cusco or surrounding area, but they were able to make this. This is adobe mixed with local stone. And so this is reconstructed. And uh, you can see that it's relatively crude. And this is typical of the Inca time period. The Inca were a Bronze Age people, so they did not have the technology to cut hard stone. And uh, so this is the Temple of the Moon um, on the Island of the Moon at Lake Titicaca. And just in a little more detail, you can see this is uh, only partially reconstructed. The surfaces during Inca times would have been perfectly smooth and possibly even colored white because white is symbolic of the moon. And uh, so since it's not been reconstructed, we can see that the interior is relatively crude in terms of its construction. And again, th these are more walls that were built during Inca times. Uh, quite simple terracing. The island of the moon was capable of being self-sufficient. And so that's why you have uh, vast amounts of, of terraces. Population was probably only a few hundred people. And uh, what's curious, though, is what we're going to look at next. And that's this wall. Now you can see that these, uh, these stones appear to have been shaped maybe by some kind of saw or even machine. Once again, it's basalt, so you would need a much harder material like diamond encrusted blades to properly cut the basalt. So it appears that there are constructions on the island of the moon that predate the Inca. They do look like, uh, or the wall looks like it did suffer from some kind of catastrophic damage and then was reconstructed during Inca times. But it's one of the uh, small curio uh, curiosities that we find on the island. Then we are up in actually close to the coast of Peru. And this is near what's called Paracas, which is uh, on the coast. And uh, this uh, little town is located uh, in between the coast and Cusco in the highlands. It's called Huaytara. And so look at the adobe wall in the background. And then look at the stone wall on the right hand side. This is a very hard stone on the right. The stones fit perfectly together. And you can see there's quite possible evidence of heat damage to the walls. And also they fit still perfectly together. No mortar, no clay, no concrete no filler, and the wall is at least three feet thick, and it's as perfect on the outside as it is on the inside and all the way through. So this was or is located in Inca country, but could not have been made by the Inca. The Inca found it and simply ad uh, adopted it. So once again, we're looking at more of the detail Perfect fitting stones, you can't fit a human hair in the joints. The darkening of the surfaces and the peeling off the surfaces could very well indicate high heat. Uh, ancient catastro uh, catastrophe may have struck this area at one point. We also see that in the city of Cusco uh, on the megalithic walls. And then an obvious comparison. Here you see the original structure uh, from the bottom halfway up and then either Inca or colonial Spanish work out of adobe above it. So two levels of construction, superior on the bottom, inferior on the top, and this ancient doorway was at some point in time filled in. And again, another one of these trapezoidal 
doorways typical of the Inca culture, but also much more typical of the older megalithic builders. The Inca simply adopted the, the trapezoid shape because they found it aesthetically pleasing. And again, the super tight fitting of the, uh, the stones themselves, the quarry is in the nature of 20 to 30 miles away. Not huge stones, one person or two people could have carried each one. Uh, so it's not on a grand scale, but it's the accuracy of the workmanship that's impo uh, important to look at. <coughs> and then again, you have this very interesting looking damage here and there and in other locations. Uh, it's a very dense, tight fitting stone. Uh, it doesn't normally weather that way. So that's indicative of some kind of external uh, damage hitting the site. Uh, here, especially on this one corner, you can see on the left side, it's still quite immaculate, some dark staining of some kind. And then the farther that we get to the right hand side of it, the more the damage, the more it looks like the surfaces have literally been blown off. And so I think that this is another example of a super ancient structure that could be as much as 12,000 years old that was hit by an ancient catastrophe, um, possibly blasts of plasma heat from the sun. And then here I am just in terms of the sense of scale. Once again, we see these trapezoid shapes and this profound damage to the surfaces. And once again, the majority of the damage is on one corner. As, if, as you see on the left-hand side, you have uh, the stone that has blown off or peeled off. And then on the right-hand side, it's still quite intact. So something very devastating happened on one corner of the building, much more than the rest. And you see the size of the lintels. The lintels are quite massive and interlock quite perfectly. And as we progress down the side, once again, the ancient structure on the bottom, going halfway up, the either Inca or um, Spanish colonial work above, and then the arched entranceway is colonial Spanish. So this is what we often find in these locations. You'll find different ages, uh, the most ancient aspect always incorporated into the later construction, because why would you take something down when it has been so well made. And inside the building, these interesting uh, trapezoid shapes, but not 90 degree angles. It's just two angles coming together. Uh, it's the only building of its kind that I found so far that has this, so it's quite curious. And when we look on the opposite wall, <coughs> after there are some of these normal trapezoid shapes too, but on the opposite side of the wall are windows, trapezoidal windows. So did it have something to do with sunlight coming in? Uh, did it have to do with sound or vibration? <clears throat> it's a very curious building that very few people visit. And if you want to see it, again, the location is a small town in the highlands of Peru called Huay Tora. So you can see the ancient recesses here, the trapezoid shapes being utilized uh, in the modern church. That was typical that um, ancient structures, whether they be Inca or even high-tech pre-Inca, uh, would be used as churches, um, especially in the city of Cusco. All of the colonial churches are built on top of or made of much more ancient Inca temples which in turn are built on top of much more ancient megalithic sites. So here you see the opposite side with the trapezoidal shaped windows. Uh, when the light comes through, it goes towards those, those angled uh, depressions. And uh, again, let's compare here. These are the trapezoid shapes letting the light in. <clears throat> and on the opposite wall, we have these angled depressions. So not something I've been able to fully figure out. Uh, the other complication is the fact that uh, there have been two fires inside the building 
over the course of time. So this internal darkening is the result of an in internal fire, but the external damage uh, is unlikely to have been from these two fires. So that probably happened far, far lo uh, longer ago in time. And now we're still in the highlands of Peru, near the uh, city of Ayacucho, which was a major Inca settlement. And these are these uh, steps you have to get to in order to get to some of them. They're currently building a new road, so it took us several hours to get there. But uh, some of the most interesting places are not located near where tourists go. So it requires quite a bit of effort to be able to go and, and visit them. But in this case, it worked out quite well for us. So we're in this little village driving through, trying to find an ancient church, a Catholic church, built on top of an Inca settlement, built on top of an older megalithic work. And here we are. So of course you see the church, uh, relatively crudely made. Uh, this interesting shape on the left-hand side which is from the older, much, much older, megalithic time period, and then some polygonal walls here. And this is uh, an Inca reconstruction. You can tell because you see these beautifully shaped uh, blocks that had to have been cut uh, using some kind of relatively high technology because the stone is basalt. And so uh, the Inca found an ancient megalithic site located here, and they reconstructed it as best they could. Part of this niche may be original, but uh, it's obvious that that is a reconstructed effort. On the left-hand side, a mix of ancient megalithic blocks and then local material found in the area. And here, too, this is another uh, Inca reconstruction. Notice these almost perfectly shaped cubes, which had to have been cut uh, and shaped at a quarry using a relative level of high technology and then much rougher material. <coughs> so this is typical of an Inca reconstruction uh, effort at a much more ancient location. Then we have the staircase going up to the church. You see that the stones interlock quite perfectly, no gaps in between. So this is more likely, or this is, part of the megalithic aspects uh, of the construction here. Because of the great workmanship of the megalithic builders, uh, this has withstood earthquake after earthquake. And so it was in place when the Inca found the location and so they simply incorporated it into the construction of their temple. And then when the colonial Spanish arrived, they converted the, or the uh, Inca temple into their colonial church. And here, this again is likely, actually this could very well be the uh, so-called megalithic time period. Uh, not that the stones are huge, but look at the perfect way that they interlock. Uh, there has been some damage in the upper areas, but this is uh, the polygonal work, which uh, is typical of the Cusco, Peru area, done by the mysterious ancient megalithic builders. This wall section was found by the Inca maybe 800 years ago, and so they built their temple incorporating what was already there. And again, when we take a compass and uh, go up to the wall, we see that it's several degrees off where it's supposed to be. It should be perfectly north, south, east, and west, but it's off by, it looks in this case, uh, 30 degrees, and so that's quite curious. Originally, it would have been built perfectly north, south, east, and west, and so it could be that the axis or tilt of the Earth has changed over the course of time, and that may well have happened during the cataclysmic events of about 12,000 years ago. And here, we find interesting looking damage. Again, look at the beautiful way that it was originally constructed, and then the surface of the stone is falling off. 
So it's quite likely that catastrophic damage in terms of heat happened in this location. Um, and again, we've seen this in many other locations in different megalithic areas of the world, uh, Peru and Egypt and elsewhere. And again, it could indicate very much that according to the theory of Dr. Robert Schock, a geologist, that plasma from the sun struck specific points of the earth uh, 12, approximately 12,000 years ago, which uh, is at the same time as the very rapid ending of the last ice age. And here on the left hand side you have the Inca reconstruction and on the right hand side you see the original megalithic. So the, the left hand side of the wall fell down as a result of some kind of major uh, earthquake or other cataclysmic event. Then the Inca found the site several thousand years later and then they, they rebuilt it. They wanted to integrate the work that they found on the right here with their level of craftsmanship. But the level of craftsmanship on the right is profoundly greater than that on the left. And here we see vitrification, which is where the surface of the basalt has literally melted. So there you see boiling marks of the stone. That would require at least 1,000 degrees Celsius. And so that would not have been from a standard open fire. That would be from some kind of possible plasma event striking and boiling the surface and blowing some of the stone off. And this, just in close up, again, you see the surface of the stone has not only melted, but it's turned into a type of glass. And moving along, I think this again is megalithic uh, in nature, not huge in terms of scale, but incredible in terms of the interlocking nature of the stone. The way it was done would be very much earthquake proofing, and then compare that with the stone on the left-hand side on the top. You can see it's much rougher, so I think that is an indication of Inca repair work done to a much older uh, megalithic structure. And here, here we have Irene uh, sitting inside this interesting looking piece of stone. Uh, where it originally was located, we don't know. But you see the scale of it, it's at least five tons. It's made of um, basalt. And the surfaces look like they were shaped using some kind of advanced technology. And uh, above her is where that area of melting or vitrification is located. And so uh, this is the only location I've been able to find so far in the highlands of Peru that clearly show ancient vitrification of hard stone surfaces. Then right next door we have uh, another megalithic structure. You can see they've had to reinforce it uh, because it's uh, in danger of, of collapsing. Something struck this with an intense force and basically blew the stones of the left and the side off. Uh, thankfully, the rest of it is still intact. But again, we're going to see the combination of uh, Inca work and then older megalithic work. So this is an Inca repair. You see this perfect joinery. So these two stones <coughs> are from the first time period of construction. Those stones put into there are Inca repair work. <clears throat> and then more Inca repair on the left-hand side. So that's older here, later there. Pre-Inca, Inca. And uh, another of the megalithic structures turned into a temple by the Inca. Uh, somewhat intact on the bottom. Repair work farther up, like that. So the Inca found this damaged by some kind of uh, ancient event and then they adopted it and then they repaired it and they used it as a, a temple of some kind and then they abandoned it when the Spanish entered the area somewhere in the region of 450 years ago and this is one of the original gates into it again a trapezoid shape 
not something that was invented by the Inca, but something that was adopted because of its aesthetic beauty and also because a trapezoid shape like that is much stronger than a simple uh, rectangular doorway. So the two sides are pushing down and pushing into each other. That makes it very rigid, very strong. And then, so the portal or the doorway is, is intact, and then ink of repair work on the upper right-hand side. And again, this is uh, indicative, most likely, of the first time period of construction, very tight-looking uh, joinery in the basalt stone. Some uh, movement here from an ancient earthquake, most likely. And then the later work of the Inca in reconstruction. Uh, they tried to fit the wall together back as, as well as they could. Uh, some people would say, well, maybe this is Spanish, but the Spanish actually didn't bother doing reconstruction like this. They brought with them the, the concept of concrete, so they would concrete everything back together. It was also a way to simply rebuild something, because if you use mortar or clay, it's a lot faster technique than trying to interlock the stones once again. So to me, this looks like the Inca very much respected what it is they found, and they tried to repair it as best as they could. And once again, an original doorway, quite tight fitting, showing uh, major damage, and then some Inca repair on the upper right hand side and down to here. Uh, here's the original tight fitting together. And uh, once again, the same thing. You see that the stone tightly fits together all the way from the front to the back. There are no gaps inside. It's all very precision workmanship, and uh, that is indicative of having uh, levels of lost ancient high technology capable of very efficiently cutting a very hard stone like basalt. So we're indicating at least diamond level of technology or possibly even more advanced than that. And also in the area we find uh, Inca work. Uh, this is simply uh, carved into a, a large stone. This was a, a way of uh, actually predicting the future or prophecy by pouring corn beer down the channel. You would watch the pattern of how it moved in these snake-like uh, fashion and then you would be able to, what you would do is ask a question, then pour the corn beer and then the probability or percentage that went down the left or right side would indicate a yes or no answer to a certain percentage. So 70% yes, 30% no, you know, on and on. But you see the roughness of the work. So that's indicative of Inca level technology. And just a close up of another one, uh, div prob uh, probable divining device of some kind from the Inca time period. And here we are at another location in the highlands of Peru. This is a slab of basalt stone that weighs approximately 15 tons. It was found buried underground, and it's located at a site called Wari, which was a culture that lived just prior to the Inca culture. Uh, they had no level of technology whatsoever. Their building style was quite a bit cruder than the Inca, as indicated by the wall right in behind here and what you can see above. So in a comparison between this workmanship and whatever shape that, you're talking night and day. So this was an earlier construction literally found uh, buried underground by archaeologists about 10 years ago. And this is another one of these giant slabs found buried underground. It weighs somewhere in the region of 5 to 10 tons. And again, compare the workmanship of that <coughs> with the walls on the right-hand side. So whether the Wadi culture even knew that that stone existed, we don't know to this day. But uh, clearly it's finer in workmanship and older than the other work. And this is standard Wadi culture construction. Again, it's like dry stacking of stone maybe utilizing a little bit of mortar. Uh, the Inca were superior, and the Inca came later. The Wadi culture was relatively smaller in the area of uh, Andahuaylas in uh, the highlands of Peru. 
And this is one of their ceremonial structures. You see, quite crudely made, relatively. And dry stacking of stone walls. But then we find these stone features as literally as if a drill had gone through the basalt. And these stones interlocked with one another, like a male and female coupling. It could have been uh, some kind of uh, way of moving water, but uh, what level of technology would have to be involved in order to cut into the stone like that? So this is another example of ancient stonework done using some level of high technology, destroyed and then discovered by the Wadi culture somewhere around a thousand years ago. And then here we go. Uh, here we see more of the drill holes, and then these, um, these half uh, drill holes, all part of an ancient drainage device made of very hard stone, discovered broken to pieces, and only recently discovered by archaeologists in the, in the area. Also in the background, look at the stones on the left, or, uh, left wall. You see some of them had to have been precision cut in ancient times and then rebuilt by the Wadi and then contrast that with the wall that you see on the right hand side very crude on the right side uh, ancient high-tech stone cutting incorporated into a Wari structure and just again I just I find these fascinating <laughs> one of the only locations in the Highland, uh, Highlands of Peru where you find this kind of uh, ancient plumbing of some kind at work. And also in the same location, we have these giant slabs of basalt. Look at the crudeness of the wall below, and then uh, giant slabs of stone that had to have been cut using saws of some kind. So again, you have night and day in terms of, uh, of workmanship. And this is what that structure looks like now. It's likely that it was rebuilt by the Wadi from uh, the s these slabs found in the area. They may have converted it into tombs or possibly even into cisterns for holding water of some kind and contrast those stones with the walls that you see around it. Very crude, very sophisticated. And also, unfortunately you can't see, but uh, this actually may be an original structure because it's perfectly level on the top, like zero degrees. So that would indicate that it is in its original location rather than being reconstructed. And then curious holes cut into the stone. Um, again, this is a very different kind of construction. I don't know where the, uh, the quarry for this work is, uh, likely not uh, in the adjacent area. But very hard basalt. And then when we're in the interior, you can see the stone interlocks. So that indicates that this is uh, in its original location with some kind of damaging happening at some point in time and then being reconstructed. And this gives you a sense of scale with me climbing in, finding it very difficult to climb back out again. But there we have me inside of it. So you can see that uh, part of the structure is original and part of it was reconstructed. And again, these, these may not be drill holes, but interesting to have holes. That's why I think it was actually a cistern of some kind for holding water rather than being a tomb and quite precision joinery that you can see right here. And uh, that's just me on top of it. And as we progress out of this complex, you see once again the difference in stone workmanship. This giant slab that's more or less in the middle as compared to the very rough work of the walls around it, like that. So this as well could be a cistern, but uh, made in uh, the Wari time period. And so this, the giant slabs would have been used to make the cistern itself and then that would have been used as the lid to hold the water inside. So recycling of ancient work. And here again another example. These are probably cisterns 
that were rebuilt by the Wari culture and the walls surrounding it, the uh, Wari workmanship itself. So constantly, over and over again, we're seeing two different time periods. We're seeing conventional work, such as the Wari we see here, or the Inca, and then the recycling and inheriting of much more complicated stonework from the past. And uh, there is no possibility that all of this could have been done by the Wadi culture. And that's why we have to change. It's pointless actually changing the history books because nobody's ever going to do that. But simply by watching this presentation, you are seeing that lost ancient high technology did exist in locations not all over the world, but uh, predominantly in Peru, Bolivia, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, probably Greece, Turkey, maybe also in Southeast Asia. And uh, this, is where we, this is where the uh, education begins, simply by showing you a series of sl uh, slides like this and presenting the evidence that uh, civilization is much more complex and longer in terms of history than what we've been taught. Thank you.